Today, we are going to finish section 1.7 and then section 1.8, or at least that's the plan, and it's a very realistic plan. We've already defined um, linear dependence and linear independence. So today we're just going, I just is just one of these ticks. Uh, today we're going to introduce some theorems, state a few facts about linear dependence and linear independence. The equation AX equals zero has non Trivial solutions if and only if um, the columns of A are Linearly dependent. So we've talked about systems of equations and vector equations and matrix equations being really the same thing, but sometimes it's easier to use one or the other. So this is last week's lecture about homogeneous systems, essentially, um, together with Tuesday's definition, recast to be about matrix equations. So we say that a system has infinitely many solutions if there's at least a homogeneous system has non-trivial solutions. If there's a free variable, we say that a vector equation has non-trivial solutions if the vectors are dependent. Matrix equations don't really get their own terminology. We just recast the question in terms of vector equations. So, if we want to know whether this equation has non-trivial solutions, well, um, we ask, or at least in terms of this theorem, we ask about the columns. This is one of these things where, I mean, if you wanted to know whether that matrix equation has non-trivial solutions, I mean, you wouldn't really use this theorem. What you do is you'd solve it in your calculator, and then there's either infinitely many solutions or there's finitely many, only one solution. So um, this theorem isn't something you use in practice to answer the question, does AX equal zero have non-trivial solutions? Um, what we're going to see eventually, um, gosh, where might this be? Maybe late in chapter two? Um, there's, going, there's this theorem that's just this enormous list of like 
20 things that are logically equivalent to each other. So we're sort of building up to that theorem. AX equals zero, has non-trivial solutions, is logically equivalent to the columns of A being linearly dependent, is logically equivalent to a bunch of other stuff. And I mean, this, this, this theorem is really the definition of a matrix times a vector together with the definition of linear dependence. So this isn't really a proofs class. We're not big on proofs unless they're helping us illustrate something. But the statement that this matrix times this vector equals zero is the same as the statement that x1 times the first vector plus x2 times the second vector equals zero. That's, that's the definition of a matrix times a vector. So the first equation has non-trivial solutions if and only if the second equation has non-trivial solutions if and only if the vectors in the second equation are dependent. That's the definition of dependent. At this point, we'll state in our quick succession a list of four theorems. We might give proofs as well. Again, the proofs are not because, you know, I want you to write proofs on tests or whatever. If we give proofs, it's because they're providing helpful illustrations of the definitions that we're using. So, theorem, a set containing a single vector is dependent if and only if that vector is the zero vector. So I can never remember which directions the arrows go in when I'm doing an if and only if proof. But we can prove this in both directions. Let V B dependent. Then by the definition of linear dependence, there's a non-trivial combination of the vectors in that set that is equal to zero. Now there's only one vector in the set, so a linear combination of the vectors in the set is just this. This is equal to zero. And when I talk about non-trivial combinations, I mean, at least one of the coefficients isn't zero. Well, there's only one coefficient here, so that one coefficient isn't zero. And if a coefficient is not zero, you can divide by it. I mean, we talk about scalar multiplication for intents and purposes. We also have scalar division. I mean, we can divide by A. 
by doing this. And then a scale there are times the zero vector is still the zero vector. So if the set's dependent, the vector is the zero vector. Going the other way, we're running out of space, but fortunately, this next part of the proof is going to take exactly one line to write down. If V is the zero vector, one times V is zero. Any scale there times the zero vector is zero. So one times V is a non-trivial linear combination that's equal to zero. So again, this is non-trivial. So V is a dependent set. We have a non-trivial combination of the vectors in that set that's equal to zero. And I mean, I just, sometimes I write something and I'm just sort of wondering where did that come from? The one specifically doesn't matter. What matters is that you have a non-zero number times V and the result is zero. 2 times v is also 0. So is negative 7 times v. These are all non-trivial linear combinations. Theorem. Any set Containing zero is dependent. Uh, proof. So say we have some set of vectors and one of the vectors is zero. So let's write that down like this. So what this proof is going to remind us of, what this proof is going to illustrate is that a Linear combination of vectors is non-trivial if even one of the scalars in the combination isn't zero. So one times the zero vector plus zero times V1 plus zero times V2 plus up to zero times Vn, this is non-trivial because, you know, most of these coefficients are zero, but to be non-trivial, we only need one coefficient that's not zero. In this case, that one. And all of the terms we're adding are zero. So we put all of these things together and we get the zero vector. And that's a non-trivial linear combination. So these vectors are dependent. Um, Question so far.
when we're working with sets of only two vectors, which sometimes happens, like if you're messing around on a map, and the vector represents a direction, it will, you might have just two vectors. Um, theorem. If we just have two vectors, V1, V2, that sets dependent. if and only if one vector in the set is a multiple of the other. Um, in fact, as long as neither of those vectors is the zero vector, then both of the vectors in the set is a scalar multiple of the other vector in the set. And proof. So let's say this set is dependent, then there's a non-trivial combination that looks like this. Um, again, in most cases, both those a's are going to be non-zero. If um, if one of those a's is non-zero, this would be telling us that, I mean, if one of those a's were zero, like if a1 were zero, that would be telling us this, which would then tell us that. So unless um, one of these vectors is the zero vector, these are both going to be not to zero, but let's see, the A isn't a vector. I don't want the little bar over it, but at least one of them can't be. Otherwise, this would be the trivial combination. It wouldn't do the straight dependence. If A1 is not zero, V1 is negative A2 divided by A1 times V2. Just do college algebra, essentially. Take V2 over to the right. A1's not zero, so you can divide by it. Negative A2 over A1 is a scalar, so one of these vectors is a scalar multiple of the other. Let's, let's do a new frame. Let's... Say that one of the vectors now is a scalar multiple of the other vector. Well, then 1 v1 minus alpha v2 equals zero. This is a non-trivial linear combination. Um, no matter what alpha is, this one in front of the v1 is surely not zero. So this is a non-trivial linear combination, and v1 and v2 
are dependent. So, sadly, sadly, because it's such a nice result, but we lose this if we have more than two vectors. You know, if we have three vectors, they can be linearly dependent, and one of them, none of the vectors is just a scalar multiple of any of the other vectors. What we do have is a weaker statement, a set of vectors vectors is dependent if at least one of the vectors in the set is a linear combination of the other vectors. And we're going to you that this is an important theorem. Um, I've suggested already that the reason we care about, about linear independence is that from an information theory point of view, if vectors are dependent, they're not repeating the same information. Each vector is providing something useful. That same line of reasoning is going to suggest that if we have a dependent set, there's redundant information, and we should be able to get rid of vectors and not really change anything. And we're going to use this theorem when we do that. We're going to specifically say, okay, if a vector is a linear combination of these other vectors, it's repeating their information, and we should just toss it out. But that's, that's for later. That's just trying to set the stage a little. For now, we can give a proof. I don't know if it's the most exciting thing, but we've proved all of the other theorems, so why stop now? So one direction is easy. Suppose that one of the vectors, let's just say v1 for simplicity, is a linear combination of the other vectors. Well, maybe you can guess what's going to come next. It's exactly the same argument we made on this frame. Zero equals negative one V one. And negative 1 is not 0, so this is now definitely a non-trivial combination. I, what did I do? I did something weird. That's v1. We'll start numbering at C at two, C two, V two.
there. It's a non-trivial combination because of that negative one. So this is certainly a linearly dependent set. So if one of the vectors is a linear combination of the others, the set is um, dependent. And going the other way, again, this is very similar to an argument we've already done. Um, say the vectors are dependent. Now, if the vectors are dependent, we can write a linear combination of the vectors. And this is a non-trivial linear combination. So some of those c's might be zero, but at least one of them isn't. Let's say, just picking one at random, but let's say c2 is not zero. Well, you can, again, college algebra this. If C2 isn't zero, let's see, that should be a V3. We can take everything over to the right, except for this term. And then because C2 isn't zero, we can divide by it. And we find that the vector V2 is a linear combination of the other vectors. So we should be careful not to interpret this theorem as being stronger than it is. I guess one quick word of warning. Um, I underlined the phrase at least one. That is a different phrase from if I'd written every vector. Um, this is a linearly dependent set. Um, according to this theorem, it's a linearly dependent set because one of the vectors is a linear combination of the other vectors. Um, that first vector is not the linear combination of the other vectors, though. It is, you cannot write one zero equals C one zero one plus C two zero three. There is no way to write that equality. How do I know that? What's the argument here? That anything prime zero can't equal one? Yeah, that's exactly correct. We're going to have C1 times zero is going to be our top coordinate here. That's zero. C2, zero is going to be zero, and then zero plus zero can't equal one. 
So this theorem is true. At least one of the vectors in the set is a linear combination of the other vectors. That's different from saying that all of the vectors are linear combinations of the rest. And now a, uh, a really important theorem. I mean, these theorems have all been pretty important. We're going to use these off and on, but here's a really classic one. Any set of more Just try that M over again. Any set of more than N vectors in R N is linearly dependent. So you cannot have large linearly independent sets. In particular, for the purposes of this class, you cannot have infinitely, infinite linearly independent sets. Linearly independent sets have to be small, by which I really mean finite, and by which I more specifically mean that if we're in R2, we can have at most two. If we're in R3, we can have at most three. So without putting anything into reduced row echelon form, or without really doing any work at all. Here are three vectors. There are three of them, but they're in R2. Three is bigger than two. These vectors are linearly dependent. And I'm going to more or less give a proof of this. Um, I'm going to work with these specific vectors, so it won't be a formal proof where we have v sub 1 to v sub n and work completely abstractly. But the argument I'm going to make here is going to work for any set of more than n vectors in Rn. And as a bonus, we'll use this first theorem. So this illustrates how theorems like this can be helpful, even if you have a specific matrix, you wouldn't use the theorem, because if you have a specific matrix, you're just going to put something in reduced row echelon form. But the theorem can still be useful. So the columns so a bunch of vectors are linearly dependent if and only if a matrix equation has non-trivial solutions. So the vectors 1, 2, 2, negative 9, Three, eight, four, 
are dependent dependent if and only if this matrix equation has non-trivial solutions which is true if and only if um so this terminal that what i'm about to say is going to be a little wonky i hope it's clear what i mean we don't you know because this matrix equation didn't come from a system of linear equations we don't really have variables here right but but we'll still understand you know we've got an augmented matrix or we will have an augmented matrix in a moment when we solve this matrix equation. And in augmented matrices, columns represent variables, except for the last column, which represents a quality. So, it's a little wonky to talk about free variables because I haven't written any variables down. But this has non-trivial solutions if and only if there is at least one free variable. And you might think that at this point I should be reaching for my calculator, but I'm not. There's not any need. There is at least one free variable. How do I know that? Well, basic variables happen when a column has a pivot position. Free variables happen when a column has no pivot position. A pivot position is the first non-zero entry in a row after I'm picking up some terrible habits, but writing Gauss-Jordan elimination gets pretty annoying, so we'll use your calculator's notation. The pivot position is the first non-zero entry in a row after we perform the row operations and put it in reduced row echelon form. Let's take this. Let's go back here and let's think it through. If the pivot position is the first entry in a row, you can't have more pivot positions than you have rows. Ergo, you can only have two pivot positions. Ergo, 
you can only have two basic variables. But we have three variables, meaning that at least one of our variables cannot be basic. Meaning at least one of our variables must be free. Meaning that there are non-trivial solutions, meaning that those vectors are dependent. And this, I mean, if you sort of summarize this proof in like a very like one, two sentence uh, summary of the proof, those zeros never really came up. The reason this proof worked is that there were more um, columns, then there were rows here. So there were only two rows, so there were only two pivot positions at most, but there are three columns, so one column isn't a pivot column. And I mean, if you look at how that works here, the number of vectors is the number of columns, the number of rows comes from the two in R2. We're in R2, so our vectors have two rows. So, um, like if we had seven vectors in R4, it would be the same thing. We'd have at most four pivot positions, but we'd have seven variables. So um, some of the variables have to be free, and there are infinitely many solutions. So I say one of the one of the major definitions or theorems, I should say, in a linear algebra, its importance probably isn't evident now, but will be when we progress a little in the course. Any questions about this? Uh, we finished this section, if not. So let me end this recording.